All right, folks. So in today's video, we're going to talk a little bit about nine to one antennas. We're going to talk about NFED wire antennas, and we're going to build a nine to one un un, and then we are going to cut a counterpoise and an element wire for that. So stay tuned and check it out. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond. Thanks for watching, everybody. Oh, and a little bit of sneak peek eye candy. Here's the finished product. Okay, so we want to talk a little bit about different types of um, NFED wire antennas, and we're going to do this to reduce confusion and hopefully clear things up for some folks who need that. So there's three main types that I'm going to talk about, uh, the first being a long wire. And you hear a lot of people say, hey, just get a long wire, put a long wire on your radio, you'll be good to go. Uh, and we refer to this as an NFED long wire antenna, EFLW. Now, the ARRL defines it as 1.5 wavelengths of a wire. Um, so if you were using, let's say, a 20-meter uh, antenna, 20-meter long wire antenna, being 1.5, this would be 30 meters long, right? 1.5 times 20 is 30. Um, and that's how we get that. Uh, in this video, what we're really concentrating on are random wire uh, antennas, and they're really anything but random. And we'll get into that as we're trying to figure out how long we should make our wire. Um, so what I said here, it's a, it's a specific length that isn't resonant on any amateur radio band. And there's some people who are way smarter than me who've done some calculations as to what will be the best. So we'll take a look at that during the build portion of this particular video. And then there is a half wave um, NFED uh, dipoles, what they're referred to as. And this is half of a wavelength on the lowest frequency that you want to use. So, for example, if you were going to build an antenna to operate on uh, the 40 meter band, your antenna would be 20 meters long. And these half wave uh, antennas actually work off of harmonics and allow you to have a multi banded antenna. And that's what's really nice about the random wire antenna is it's multi banded as well. And uh, that's why we're choosing to work with that one for this particular video. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the advantages. And so folks say, well, why would I want to use an NFED uh, antenna like this? Um, they're low cost. Uh, when you look at buying an antenna, they're lower cost than some of the other ones. And uh, they're extremely affordable for home brewing or, or kits. Um, they're easy to home brew. So during the course of this video, you're even going to see somebody like me put one together. They're easy to install, and you can use them in a variety of possible configurations. So you can mount them as a horizontal, like a dipole. You can mount them as an inverted V, like an inverted V dipole. And when you have your unknown on the ground, and it comes up to an apex and comes back down. Uh, people uh, mount them as inverted L's, where they go up and they go across, um, which is pretty handy. Um, some people mount them straight up as a as, as a vertical. What I typically do is I mount mine as a sloper antenna, which means it goes off on an angle. And uh, when you do that, you want to look anywhere from about 45 to 60 degrees um, is what you want to do. Uh, I have uh, can provide multiband operation. And again, that's huge for me when I operate. I'd like to be able to use one antenna that I can use on multiple bands without having to go out and modify the antenna by moving a coil, setting, um, disconnecting uh, traps or links and stuff like that. So I, I really like these antennas. Um, I have Stealthy because you can hide these uh, in plain sight from your HOA. They also can be lightweight and portable depending upon how you design and build them. So that's some advantages. Some disadvantages, um, they can be noisy and prone to RFI from close electrical equipment. Uh, and this is where a lot of people talk about using chokes and using uh, counterpoises and those things. Um, they can also generate noise and RFI and that can upset some folks. Um, you get inconsistent radiation patterns and takeoff patterns compared to a dipole antenna. So in a lot of the learning that we've done to become ham radio operators and to get our licenses, we learn about dipole antennas, isotropic radiators, and how they radiate signals, or RF, uh, to get to other hams. And depending upon the type of uh, uh, antenna that you have, how you've mounted it, the length of the element, all those things uh, take into consideration, you get some inconsistent radiation patterns. Um, and then to have ground and counterpoise configurations can be problematic. You really do want to make sure that you have a good grounding and counterpoise solution for your antenna. So speaking specifically about uh, NFED random wires, um, what I have again is, is that their length is anything but random and they should be non-resonant on any amateur radio frequency or multiple of that frequency. 
Um, they tend to have a very high impedance, and so we use an un un, a nine to one un un, uh, as a match box, a transmission line transformer, or impedance matching unit. Uh, depending upon who you are and where you're from, you may call these things different, the same thing, a different thing. The un un ratio is typically nine to one, and what that means is, is that we can take a 450 ohm impedance and transform that down to 50 ohm to match our transmission line. If your impedance is higher than that, say 900, it's only going to bring it down to a 100 and give you a 2 to 1 SWR. And that's why we use a tuner in the last bullet. Um, these do require the use of the tuner in some cases. Now, you're going to find where it seems to be resonant without the use of the tuner, or I should say it's matched without the use of a tuner on certain bands, and then other bands, you're going to need it. And that's all going to depend upon how you construct this and the length of the wire that you choose to use. And so the last thing I wanted to talk about is what about RFI and do I need a choke? Um, and the short answer is it depends. Uh, I put a choke at the antenna feed point. And when I talk about a choke, it's a one-to-one -one balun, not an un, -un that uh, reduces current on the outside of my coaxial shield. And then I also put a choke at the tuner or the radio feed point. Um, I do have a video on RFI and chokes, and I can go ahead and link that below where it covers it in more detail. But what I find is, is that these NFED uh, antennas, particularly 9 to 1s or random wire, uh, are particularly RFI prone and do require the use of a choke at a minimum at the antenna feed point. Okay, this is a toroid. It is a T240-43. So 43 is the mix type. 240 is the outer diameter in inches, and that is how you measure these things. These are going to be what we use, well actually just one of them, uh, as the heart of the antenna. We're going to use this as our 9 to 1 un un in our transformation. Um, we'll take place uh, from about 450 ohms on the antenna side to about 50 ohms on the coax side to give us a better match. So here's an example of a 140 uh, dash 43 toroid that is round in, wound in the configuration that uh, we're going to use for this particular project. But I kind of wanted to run down the different parts and talk about what we're going to use and how we're going to do that so we just don't jump in blindly. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the wire that we are going to use. So this wire is an 18 gauge uh, wire made by Remington. It is stranded, it is rated for up to 600 volts, which is nice, and it is PTFE or Teflon coated, and it is slippery, making it difficult to work with, but um, that's what we're gonna use. Now, some people will say, well, you shouldn't use stranded wire, and some people say it doesn't matter. I've used stranded wire in the past and have had fine results. Um, when you talk about what works and what doesn't work, when things work, they can work well or they can work better or they can work worse. I don't think that the biggest problem I'm going to have is going to be this being stranded wire. Um, another thing that I could choose to use is a magnet wire, and I use these this in a lot of other projects and builds. Um, but I'm not using it here. I'm choosing to use this. Uh, if you do use magnet wire and it's the same color, you can get this in different colors. You want to make sure that you mark the ends because you are going to have to do some things with the ends of these wires and you don't want to get that mixed up. So while we're at it, let's just talk real quick about what we are going to use for the aerial. And maybe I should say element. But this is uh, something I got from Davis RF or the Wireman. Um, and it's polystealth 18 gauge, 500 feet of wire. We're not going to use all 500 feet. We'll talk about length of wire later. Um, but this is a very rugged, durable wire, and the reason I'm choosing to use this is, is that this is going to be more of a permanent installation. I'm not going to take this portable. I'm not going to take it uh, different places. I'm going to mount it up out back, and uh, I will likely use it there until I take it down and move it somewhere else. But uh, it's going to be a permanent or a semi-permanent installation. All right, this is the project box that we're going to use, and uh, I'll include links to this below. I have no idea what, what size it is. Uh, let's take a quick look here. One, two, three, four. It's about five inches by one, two, three, about three and a half inches by about two inches tall. And uh, the reason I'm using this is because I had them. I have, to, I have a couple of these. It is an ABS plastic, and uh, it should be fine. Here is one with the screws taken off, and you can see it comes with a little bit of waterproofing uh, that you can put in here, and then when you screw this on, it gives you a better seal. 
Now, some people say that toroids get hot, and they do, and that you should have some sort of vent or some sort of uh, snorkel or breathing apparatus here. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to do that or not. But since we got the box out, let's talk a little bit about the parts or the components that are going to go with it. Uh, we are going to mount this SO239 connector on the bottom of the box, and that way we'll be able to feed our coaxial into the bottom. And then I have this M6 I-ring that uh, we're going to drill a hole up here and we're going to mount that. And that will give us a way to hang or mount this on, on um, making it uh, more convenient. Now we're going to need two posts, one for a counterpoise, which will be on the bottom, and then one for the element or aerial uh, that will either be on the top or one of the sides. It's going to depend on how the project comes together. So what I do is I just keep a, uh, a box of these nuts and uh, bolts. And what I do is I'll use these uh, for those posts. Um, I can include a link to this below, folks. One, it's pretty simple. It's just a uh, thousand piece kit that I got off of Amazon for, I don't know, 10 or 15 bucks. I'll also use those nuts and bolts to mount this SO239 connector that we talked about. Since we're on hardware, um, I have a couple of these things, and uh, we use these for stress relief. And what you do is, is at, say, the end of your element, you might want to loop back some of your wire, and you can just feed it through here. Um, that way you have an adjustment if you need to, to lengthen or shorten your wire. You have a good connection point, and then also uh, we will use one of these for our antenna, when it comes out of the side of this box, we'll probably have a loop that connects to the I-ring that I showed you earlier, and we'll use one of these to hold that secure. And that is just to give it a nice finished look and to make sure that the, all the stress or strain relief is accounted for. Um, at the end of the element, uh, typically we use insulators, and you know, different people use different insulators for different things. As I was digging through the parts box, I found these. It looks like I paid $1.50. Uh, for each one of these at a ham fest, if I remember correctly. Now, these feel like they're made out of Teflon. A lot of times these are made out of uh, a ceramic. Either way, this will work fine. Um, and people will call these an insulator that you put at the end. Sometimes they call these dog bones. Um, we're just going to call it an insulator. I don't know. Might call it a milk bone, dog bone. I don't know. But uh, we may use any of those words interchangeably. Also, for projects like this, a little bit of heat shrink. Uh, we use this all the time. It's good stuff. And then I have uh, a box of these parts, and uh, I'm running low here on my stock, but uh, we're going to use a couple of these. And I think that that covers just about everything that we need. That said, I'm going to reserve the right to at any time say, oh, by the way, you need one of these. Like right now, we're going to use a bunch of zip ties as well. All right, I think that's it. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Okay, what I've done is, is I've cut three lengths of wire, and I've cut them at 30 inches. I'm not sure if that's the appropriate length or not, but that's what we cut them at. And uh, we're using a 43 mix toroid because that generally works well for a broader band transformer. And there's no perfect toroid for any real application in, in uh, ham radio. And I, I say that with a bit of caution because somebody will say, well, you can use a mix too as a, as a filter. Yes, that's all That's all true. But when it comes to making un-uns, uh, Mix 43 for broadbanded use is generally what you would use somewhere around 40 meters to 6 meters. And that is the zone that I'm looking in. So that's why I'm not using uh, 71 or 52 or anything like that. Um, we're using a 43. Okay, now let's go ahead and uh, get, get winding here. Now, when I wind this, I want to make sure that my wire is in a particular order based off of the diagram. Uh, so to make it easier for me when I have to start doing some connecting of things at the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm just trying to get these in order. And I want to make sure when I, when I wind, I don't have any crossover. And so I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to bring this up through the center of my toroid. And uh, this wire is, <laughs> as I mentioned, um, it's difficult to work with. And I'll just leave it at that. And now what I want to do is I want to use a zip tie to go in here and uh, hold this in place because I've only got two hands and I'm going to need three. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> All right. Um, there we are. We're, we are wrapped. And um, this was a little bit of a job, mainly because this Teflon coated wire is slippery as heck. Um, 30 inches was just maybe a little bit too long. We're going to use some of this stuff. So not that big of a deal. Not a lot of waste. Uh, I feel pretty good about it. This looks okay. I'll probably play around with it a little bit to try to try to neaten it up a little bit. But again, this stuff is uh, is super slippery. So the next thing that we are going to do is start preparing these wires for the installation. Let me just start over again. Okay, we're back taking a look at the box, and we have our wound toroid. And uh, so it's going to go in here somewhere like this, um, which makes sense. So what I think I'm going to do is this is the connection for the antenna, and I think that's going to go something like this. So we're going to mount the the lug, which is going to be one of these, over here somewhere for the antenna connection. And then this would be our connection for this green one here would be our connection that will go to a corner of this SO239. So it's going to get bolted in here. And then it's also going to go to our counterpoise. And then our counterpoise lug uh, is going to go somewhere right around here. So what I want to do is I want to take this box and I want to mark it. And I'm not one of these overly retentive type people that uh, when they mark stuff, it's got to be 100% exact. So I think that the antenna is going to go somewhere right around there. I think that uh, our counterpoise lug is going to go somewhere right around, let's call it right there, which is pretty similar to where we put the antenna on. Uh, and then this would be the top of our box and somewhere right around here is where we're going to drill the hole for the I-ring. And then taking a look at the bottom, I do want to be somewhat exact with this uh, because it's going to require some other stuff. So I think we're going to look right about there, and then we're going to drill a hole to put this in. So we're going to come back, and uh, I'm going to show you how I set this up and how I do the drilling. One thing is, is that you do have to be careful with uh, this plastic because it does have a propensity to break. All right, thank you.
Okay, we're back from prepping the box. So let's go ahead and start to attach some of our hardware. And we want to do this because we want to be able to find out exactly how our Anun or our toroid is going to fit inside this box. I'll tighten that up some more off camera so I don't waste a bunch of time. And then this would be our counterpoise lug. We're going to go ahead and leave that a little bit loose because we still have connections to make. But uh, once this is done, what we'll do is we'll put the, the lug or the spade connector here for the counterpoise. And then we will use this wing nut to attach it. That way, if we need to switch out the counterpoise for something or take it off entirely, um, it's an easy task to do. And then we're going to do the same thing up here for our element or aerial, as some people call it. And again, we want to leave this a little bit loose because we still have connections to make. And then again, with the wing nut. Okay, the last piece that we're going to put on here is going to be our SO239 connector. Uh, and that should be easy to do. One thing I want to point out is, is that these have a little teeny cup here. And you want to make sure that that's facing up. And that will make it a lot easier for us to solder our connections there. So let me go ahead and grab some, uh, some nuts out of this nuts assortment. Now what I do is I put the washer and the nut on the inside to keep the outside as low profile as possible. So I don't have any problems attaching any coaxial cable. All right, so we have everything roughly put together. Uh, for the sake of time off camera, I'm gonna tighten these down all the way and I'm gonna tighten this down all the way. So we will be back. All right, so now we're starting to make some progress. So what I wanna do is I wanna take a quick look at the uh, toroid that we have here and uh, just place it in the box. Now, what I'm not gonna do is I'm not gonna fix this toroid down. I'm gonna make all of my connections. Uh, this is our antenna, this is the counterpoise, and then this is our coax connector. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that all my connections are made in solid, and then I'm going to test this out. And what I can do is, is that I can actually uh, use some epoxy or hot glue or something like that to hold this in place once it's done. Generally speaking, when I'm building antennas or antenna kits, what I really don't want to do is firmly affix the toroid in place and then have a problem that I need to address because then it makes a deconstruction very difficult. Okay, so here's the template that we are going to use to do our 9 to 1. As you can see, we have the 9 wrapping. But what is important is to pay attention to the connections that need to be made. So following the instructions I put on here below, we are going to connect the upper red and the lower black together. So make sure that when you look at your orientation that your wires are in this order and that your upper red is coming off the bottom of the toroid and the lower black is coming off the top. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to do that. Then we're going to connect our upper green shield to the counterpoise and to the lug. Um, and I said that wrong. And we're going to connect the upper green to the shield and then the counterpoise lug. Then we're going to twist and connect the upper black and lower green and connect them to the center pin of the SO239. And then we're going to connect the lower red to the antenna element lug. So let's go ahead and do that now. So here's the part where everybody starts to get nervous. So we have our lower black and our upper red, and they need to come together. So I want to take a look at this. This is about where we're going to have to cut these wires. Um, and that makes it nervous, because if we mess up here, then uh, the whole thing needs to be rewound. So let's take another look, and we'll go ahead and we'll cut the black somewhere right around there. And one of the things I've mentioned in the past is, is that this wire is super duper slick or slippery. So there's a couple things we want to do. Um, one is I cut a little piece of heat shrink and we're going to go ahead and we're going to go ahead and put that on now. And that's probably just a smidgen too long. So let me go ahead and get that on there. Perfect. And then what I need to do is I need to strip away some wire here so we can get a good, a good solder connection. So let me go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to use these, but I'm going to do it off camera because I got to get this a little closer to myself. All right. So I'm going to take these two and then I'm going to twist. 
Okay, we're back with our twist. So we're just going to go ahead and we're going to solder that. And then I had to actually switch out this piece of um, heat shrink for a little bit porkier piece. So let me go ahead and fire up the soldering iron and get this soldered. Okay, I believe that that is done. And then we have a good connection. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to slide this heat shrink up and over. Okay, we got the heat shrink up there. So let's go ahead and uh, I have a heat gun, but it's upstairs. So we are just going to white trash this and um, we're going to use a lighter. Okay, that part is done. So what is next is, is that we are going to put a lug here on the antenna element and uh, we're going to get that prepared now. So the first thing I want to do is I want to come over here and I'm just going to strip some of this wire off. And so I'm going to actually just use these wire strippers just to go ahead and score this wire. And then when I do that, I can come in here with my fingernail, hopefully, and then just pull the rest of it off. So there we go. Now let me get a lug. So I'm going to use a round lug because I want to make sure that this doesn't slip off. And I also want to make sure that it fits everything correctly. And these do. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I use them. Now when I use these lugs, one of the things that I like to do is remove this plastic because I don't like it. So I'm going to go ahead and just heat this up real quick and it will come right off. See, easy peasy. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and I'm going to place this here. And uh, that seems to be holding. And then I'm going to use a set of ratcheting crimpers to go ahead and nestle everything down nice and tight. All right, that is on there. And then the next thing I like to do is fire up the soldering iron and get a little bit of a solder connection there as well. All right, this part is done. Okay, we actually jumped ahead in the instructions by doing the antenna connection, but I just wanted to get that one out of the way. The next one is, is that this would be our upper green and we're gonna have to cut this somewhere around here and prepare a, a lug like this. And I'm using a smaller one because when you take a look at the box, these are M4 bolts. These are M3, and this one fits on here just fine. So that's how we're going to connect this to the shield. But once I, when I do this, I'm going to need to have another jumper that comes out of here and then goes over here to the counterpoise. So let's go ahead and, uh, and prep that now. So just like last time, we're going to go ahead and we're going to score this. And then what I'm going to do on this side for the jumper is score that as well. Now what I want to do is I want to take both of these and somehow get them in there. Let's see, let's see just how easy this is going to be. All right, and we're back, and I'm not going to lie. Um, here's a smaller connector. It just wouldn't fit. I mean, I tried everything. I tried every trick in the book, including talking dirty. And... Uh, it just didn't work out for me. So we're just going to go ahead and we're going to crimp this on. There we go. And now we're going to fire up the soldering iron and get a little solder on there. All right, there we go. So when we look at this, this is going to go onto the shield like I explained, and then this is going to go over to the counterpoise. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to cut this and put one more crimp on here. Okay, once again, we are going to go ahead and we are going to score that. Okay, and that is scored a little bit long because what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this over. And then I'm going to give it a little bit of a squeeze. There we go. We're going to go ahead and crimp it down. We are good and crimped. And then now we're going to hit it with a little bit of solder. All 
right, and there we go. We still have to take these two wires uh, and we twist these, combine them together, and that goes into our center conductor. But what I wanted to do is I just wanted to quick get an idea of what we're looking at here. And um, everything seems to be coming along according to plan. Okay, so for these two that need to get connected to the center pin here, what I've done is I trimmed the black one and I, I went ahead and I scored and stripped the two wires. Now these two wires are supposed to get twisted. And I'm not 100% sure how well they're going to stay twisted. But uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to follow the directions. So there are our twisted wires. And now that we have these, we're going to go ahead and we're going to twist these around each other. Now remember, these are going to go into that cup that we talked about. So what I want to do now is I'm just going to hit this with a little bit of solder and make sure that we have a good connection. Okay, so this is our un -un. Um And it's not the prettiest one, but uh, I've definitely seen and worked with worse. So again, when it goes in here, we're going to have to bring this one up and connect it and then we are going to connect this piece to this top bolt and then we're going to bend this baby around and we're going to connect him to this counterpoise lug and then solder it in and then we're going to do some testing so uh, we're down on the back stretch and this is coming along rather nicely all right folks and we're back so for the sake of time let's just do a quick review we took the two wires we took a red and a black and we connected them together here then we took the lower red and we connected that to our element. Now this isn't tight, we're gonna tighten this up. But this is where the antenna element goes, this is our mount point. Then we took the lower green and we ran it to the shield connection here. And then we also ran it to our counterpoise lug in the event that we wanna use a counterpoise and because we like counterpoises, we're gonna use one. And then we took the black and the green and we twisted them together per the diagram and then we connected them to the center pin and this is soldered in place so this is pretty much done what we're going to do is we're going to come back and we're going to do a test and we're going to test to see how well this transform impedance given that it's an impedance transformer we're going to do that by shorting a capacitor across both of these lugs connecting this up to a device like an anno vna and then doing a reading so let me get that set up and then we'll come back Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here. So what I've done is I've made a jumper that goes from our antenna lug to our counterpoise lug. You can see it here. And then in the middle here, we have a uh, resistor. Now this resistor is 470 ohms, which isn't exact, but it's close enough. So let me explain. With a 9 to 1 unon or transformer, it does a transformation ratio of 9 to 1. So your coaxial cable that we use to feed into our antenna system, this is the antenna feed point here, is at 50 ohms. 50 times 9 is 450. So we would expect somewhere around 450 ohms of impedance on the end of our aerial or antenna line. Now, we know that it's not going to be exact, and that is why you are required to use a tuner with a 9 to 1 on them. So what you want to do is you want to, you want to divide, essentially, whatever your impedance here by 9. Hopefully, it's a close enough match, and if it's not, hopefully your tuner gets you where you need to be, and that's how we use a 9 to 1. So in this case, we have 470 divided by 5 is going to be slightly higher than 50 ohms. Now, here on the Nano VNA, I've done a sweep from 6.5 megahertz all the way through 14 0.5 just to go from 7 to uh, 20 meter bands and then you can see I've got a relatively flat SWR as a matter of fact here um, we're looking at like 1.116 I'm going to connect this up to nano VNA saver so we can get a little bit of a better look and see how it looks on the chart now our line's not going to be this flat we're going to have some ripple when we put an antenna on here because this is of a fixed resistance right with our with our resistor here antennas the antenna elements will react with what's called reactants it's your real resistance which we have here plus your imaginary resistance or your reactants meaning any inductions or capacitance that uh, you pick up along the way so this is a fake antenna not a real one and that's why it's as flat as it is so let's take a look at nano vna saver 
Okay, so here we are connected to Nano VNA Saver, and this makes it a little bit easier to read results. So what you can see here is that we have a calibrated sweep from 6.5 megahertz to 14.5 megahertz. And you do see the SWR start to creep up ever so slightly to 1.13. Now, the reason that that happens as we go higher in frequency is that the resistor that I used as part of the test jig is not a non-inductive or reactive, I should say, uh, resistor. It's a pretty cheap resistor. So you start to pick up reactants as you change frequencies. But in any event, we're still really happy to have this at 1.3. So what that means is that what it's doing is correct. It is reducing any impedance that it sees by one ninth, hence the nine to one on on that we're looking at here. If you're curious about how to use nano VNAs or nano VNA saver, check out the playlist that I have linked below. I've got a ton of different videos doing all kinds of ham stuff with nano VNAs that you might find helpful. Okay, let's proceed with the build. All right, folks, so here's the time in the conversation where we need to figure out how long we're going to make our element or aerial for our 9 to 1 antenna. Um, we want to talk a little bit about random wire antennas and that we want a wire that is not resonant on any particular hand band. Now, we can get a little tricky. This website is kind of like the de facto standard for determining what your length of your antenna should be. Uh, I've been playing around with 9 to 1 or random wire antennas for about four years. Um, I had a lot of conversations with a lot of hams, and they all lead back to these numbers. So let me go ahead and, uh, and scroll down and take a look. So you, uh, these are lengths that are culprits and can cause trouble with random, uh, random length antennas. So you kind of want to stay away from these different lengths because they are multiples of harmonics on these different frequencies. Um, down here, he says, so the numbers above are ones that we want to stay far away from, right? And then so he says, uh, here they are in order. Some of these numbers are too close to squeeze in between them. But here are the final numbers, in his opinions, in green below. That would be good for a long wire antenna. Um, and here it is. You have 29, 35 and a half, 41, 58, 71. You have higher than that, 84, 107, all the way up to 423. Now, I've only gone up to 71 feet. Uh, so I've done and fed uh, random wire antennas in all of these lengths and had a lot of success. Now, the longer you get, the more likely you're going to be able to have more success on the lower bands. Um, I typically operate 40 megahertz or 40 meters and higher and um, 7 megahertz. And so as a result, I typically use 58 to 29, but have used 71. For this particular build, I think we're going to target a 41-foot uh, antenna or aerial, and we're going to see how that works for us. Um, the other thing I want to mention is, is that with NFED antennas, um, you have the challenge of grounding or counterpoises. And I typically use a 17-foot counterpoise when I start tuning the antenna. Um, and that's what we're going to use here, and we're going to see how it works. I'll have a link below to a video that I did that talks all about counterpoises, 9 to 1 antennas, and why you want to use them. Uh, and it explains it in a little bit more detail, so that may be a little bit more helpful for you. Okay, we are going to go ahead and uh, cut some wire. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about the antenna. What we have here is 41 feet of the polystealth. And then uh, at the end of that, I have it folded over at one foot, and I have this keeper or clip, or I don't know what you call that here. Um, I need another one, and I think I have one in the parts box, but I couldn't find it, so I just put this zip tie on here, but I'll replace that. And then I have this insulator or dog bone to tie off the element. Um, it's folded back at one foot, but uh, I can go ahead and I can change this. I can make it greater or less depending upon uh, how the antenna performs. If you want to see how the antenna performs, come back next time and uh, we'll have this thing mounted outside and uh, we'll do some, some further testing with it. And then here is the uh, counterpoise that I built and it is uh, 17 and a half feet with one half foot folded over. And you can see how the two clips on here again with the insulator. One of the things I do with the element and with the counterpoise is at the very end of the wire, I put some heat shrink on here and seal it off. And then that way the end of my wire is insulated as well. Um, you can get very high voltages here, and we don't want anybody touching this and getting shocked, but also we don't want it arcing and uh, causing any potential problems there. I also wanted to show uh, how I use this particular uh, heat shrink and lug to create a, a point for my counterpoise to go on right here underneath of the wing. That, that's what I've done here with the element. Um, and then you can see here I have this 
strung through the mounting eye ring. I guess that's what you call it. I don't know. Um, and the reason I have that there is this adds a little bit of stress relief, so my stress isn't right here. But uh, I'm feeling pretty good about this antenna, and I think it should perform pretty well. So with that, I'm going to say thanks for watching, everybody. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond.